this is the You, Me, and BTC podcast. Welcome to episode 35. This week, we are speaking with Valerian Bennett from the Protocol.tv. He is a filmmaker who recently began exploring and enjoying Bitcoin. He spent some time in Argentina this summer and created an amazing video about Bitcoin in Buenos Aires. He'll tell us all about that and explain why he thinks it is so important to share Bitcoin stories and experiences. I personally think that Mr. Bennett really understands some of the important philosophical ideas behind Bitcoin and I enjoyed this conversation a great deal, so stick around. Your hosts are Tim Baker, John Stewart, and myself, Daniel Brown. Here we go. Hey everybody, welcome to the show today. We are sitting down with Valerian Bennett. He's a sweet guy. I had the chance to talk with him a little bit at the Crypto Line uh, conference. Uh, he was in the live show for a little bit, talked to him on the air, but he works with the protocol.tv and he's been working on a pretty cool video about Buenos Aires and Bitcoin. So I guess, well, first of all, thanks for joining us. Excellent. Thanks for, thanks for having me. And can you tell us about the protocol.tv? Yeah. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself, and that'll will probably help you understand uh, the protocol TV a little bit better. Sweet. Uh, I live and work in uh, in Los Angeles uh, as a video editor and producer. I generally work in reality TV. And about a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago, I came across Bitcoin. And you know, I think like most people, you know, I'd heard about it a little bit before and just kind of let it go by. And then I had a uh, one of the shows that I was working on ended, and I had some free time, so I was like, all right, I'm gonna you know, put my head in and, and really try to figure this thing out. So I started looking around and looking around for information. And of course, my head just started spinning with all this stuff that was out there, just because it's a lot to, I mean, it's a, you know, just a, a gigantic concept to even try to wrap your head around. Right. So I figured, you know what, rather than wait until I quote unquote understand it, let me just go out and actually buy a Bitcoin and just use it and just see if I can figure it out just by getting your, you know, getting my hands dirty. And I went on local bitcoins and the closest person to me was a, uh, a guy that I knew, <laughs> which is totally random. So I ended up just calling him up and he was really awesome. And he, he took like two weekends and we just literally were at a coffee shop on the corner, just, you know, sucking down cappuccinos and going <laughs> over every single question I could possibly have. And in that sense, I was really fortunate that I had someone who was really technically sharp, nice. who could answer all my questions. But then, you know, the reality hit was like, that's not going to happen for everybody, right? And it's like the thought that I had at the time was, you know, I really wish somebody would start putting some information out that's a little bit more, you know, that's uh, more geared towards uh, just mainstream, everyday, regular people, right? That you know, who aren't going to sit and read, you know, pages after pages of technical documents. Yeah. And once I had that thought in my head, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I work in television. I mean, talk about <laughs> least common denominator uh, type of stuff, right? <laughs> it's like that's the the downside of television is like, you know, it people, it dumbs things down. But the good part of television is that it kind of dumbs things down. And for people to really start to get Bitcoin and, and all the possibilities um, that come along with it, it definitely needs to be dumbed down. You got to start somewhere. Let's get some of the basics down and take it from there. So I thought to myself, well, what can I do since I'm not, you know, a programmer, I'm not a technical person. What can I do to, to kind of help move things along? So what I am is uh, a storyteller. So I played around a f with a few different ideas and ultimately I, I came up with uh, the basic idea of which is at the core of the protocol.tv, which is to just find people who are using Bitcoin in their daily life to solve problems and just tell their story. So it's, this is the problem that we have. This is how we're using the technology. This is how the technology is making my life better. 
so that was it. That was the, once I got that kind of, okay, what is it down? Then I started looking for stories. And that brings me to Bitcoin Buenos Aires. And if I can even go back a couple of years more than that, I, for the life of me, really, really, really wanted to go to the World Cup in Brazil. <laughs> so I had organized my life basically around making sure that happened. So it's just planning for, you know, a couple of years of, okay, this is going to happen. So then it came about this past summer. And as I was down there, or as I was starting to get to be down there, uh, that sort of overlapped with the time um, where Bitcoin was starting to get into my head. And I was like, you know, hearing about all the things that was happening in Argentina with the inflation crisis, with their sovereign debt crisis, and how Bitcoin is really taking off there in a way that you don't really see anywhere else in the world. And I was like, man, I'm so close. Yeah, let's go. What the heck? <laughs> so I decided to, uh, I literally just hopped on Twitter, um, and started getting in touch with some of the, uh, the people involved in the community down there. And they just really, really opened up their arms to me and, and welcomed me in. And I ended up spending three days there with, uh, with a camera, met, uh, another person who's down there who, uh, worked on some previous, uh, Bitcoin films and, uh, the result is is what you saw that premiered at, at Cryptolina. Yeah, that's really cool. Can you tell us a little bit about the video? Because I, I was at Cryptolina, but I actually didn't get a chance to go to most of the talks. So tell us about the video, what it's for, what it says, stuff like that. Sure. So basically, it's a, uh, a snapshot into what's happening with Bitcoin in, in Buenos Aires. And it was filmed during the first week in July, over three days there. And just to give you a little bit of background on what's happening um, in Argentina right now, they have, just through an assortment of, of government policies, they have an inflation rate that's about 30%. And probably by the end of the year's estimates, say it's probably going to go up to closer to 40%. So that means um, if you have a $100 bill and you set it on a table, and you came back in one year, that $100 would be $60. So that's just what they have to deal with in, in terms of uh, the inflation rate. And it's just caused all kinds of just weird you know, side effects throughout the economy. People are so desperate to try to find ways to store their wealth and keep hold of their money, basically, to the point where people are, are taking the, the Argentine pesos that they get and buying washing machines and buying cars, you know, just hard, tangible goods, because they know that in a year from now, they'll be able to sell that washing machine and be able to sell that car and have a heck of a lot more money than if they just would have held on to the Argentine pesos. So it's created this sort of uh, development environment where people are looking towards alternatives. And this happens to be the time where Bitcoin has started to come into being. So, the film itself is, is, uh, as I said, a snapshot and really starting to, to meet the people who are physically making things happen in the Bitcoin community there. So, uh, we speak with four people in particular. Diego Gutierrez, who's the head of the Argentine Bitcoin Foundation there. He set up this thing called Bitcoin Embassy, um, which is basically a, a building that houses a lot of community, uh, meetup groups as well as the offices of a lot of the major companies that are expanding into that area. It's got the offices of BitPay, ZipSap, BitPagos, uh, which is another company that we'll get to in a little bit. But it's basically like the epicenter of, uh, of Bitcoin development there. Uh, he also runs a uh, an investment fund to try to incubate startups and and really grow the community of companies and, and individuals that are involved in Bitcoin there. The other company that's in that building is called BitPagos, one of the other companies, and they've been on fire recently. I'm, I'm sure you probably heard a lot of the stories coming out of Argentina. A lot of them have BitPagos at the center of it. They're a payment processor, much like BitPay, except that their main hook is that instead of paying out in uh, the local currency, they make an effort to ensure that they pay out in Bitcoin. Nice. And a subtle difference, but here's the reason why that's so important, especially for the Argentine community. So the example that uh, Sebastian Serrano, who's the CEO of uh, a Bitpagos that we, that we spoke to, the example he gave was that if you have an American credit card, right? I come in, I book a hotel room, 
I pay with my credit card. Let's say just for ni- so we have nice round numbers. That's a uh, hundred dollars that I put on the credit card. U.S. merchant processing fees are generally what around like three percent or so, something like that. The processing fees in Argentina for credit cards are about seven percent. So automatically, that's you know you're getting effectively what what would be double the the charge that you get just for using the credit card. Right. The money that you get from the credit card you're not going to get that for a month just because that's just their payout schedule. So where something like Square or Stripe or something, you get your money in what, like a day or two or something like that. You're not going to get it for a month in Argentina if you use a credit card, if you're a merchant on the other end of that. And the thing is, remember, you've got 30 to 40% inflation. So if you wait a month before you're paid out, you're already taking another hit there. And if you do use a credit card, what you're going to be subject to is the quote unquote official conversion rate. So that's the point where the Argentine government says through their decree that, okay, it's eight Argentine pesos is worth one US dollar. But on the black market in real life on the streets, it's 12 Argentine pesos are worth one dollar. So you're effectively going to get another hit in the conversion rate. So all of those things add up and that hundred dollars that you got from a sale by the time you actually get to that money is maybe like fifty five, sixty dollars. Right. Now take that, multiply that over the breadth of the entire economy, and you can kind of see the problems that that you'd run into there. And so people are looking to use something like Bitpagos, get paid it's Bitcoin, right? So you get paid, you know, relatively instantly. You're going to get charged, sure, by the merchant processor, but those fees aren't going to be 7%. You're going to get your money right. instead of waiting a month. You're going to get it instantly, and you're not going to be subject to the conversion rate of the Argentine government. So they're just, I mean, you can, it sells itself, really, and, and you can see why this company is expanding <laughs> so rapidly. I think they've got uh, investment from Adam Draper and Boost VC. Uh, they just got a, another investment, I think, from uh, Barry Silbert's company. So a lot of big players are, are starting to take note of what they're doing. Another company that we went to was uh, Bitex LA. They're the first fully online exchange that's in, in Argentina. And that's just, you know, it's such an important thing to have local exchanges that build liquidity in a native environment. Just because, yeah. you know, it's we all want to get to that point where we're just using cryptocurrencies and, and digital currencies, but the reality is we're not there yet. So you have to be able to, um, as a matter of first and foremost, just convenience, um, but also just the confidence of having people know that if I want to convert into my local currency, I can. If I want to get out of my local currency and get into a digital currency, I can. So having those kind of places like Bitex LA, they're just so, so important. So that's just been one of the really big steps for just adding a, another layer of scale to the entire sort of Bitcoin economy that's going on down there. And then the other place that we went, oh, uh, we actually met with an individual. He works for BitPay. His name is Manuel Eros. And he works for BitPay, but he's also a Bitcoin core developer. And this is interesting because I think he gets into a couple of things. He's one of the guys that was instrumental in developing Copay, which is the multi-signature wallet that BitPay just released. BitPay also, they do a lot of interesting development in that they develop products for themselves, but they also uh, release those products as part of the Bitcoin core development process. So they employ him as a developer for BitPay, but they have him work on things that get rolled into Bitcoin and the, okay. the bigger picture open source community. So I, I think that's an interesting model that they have. And if you, I'm sure you guys have been following the development of multi-signature wallets, that's just going to be something that it's a, a very kind of geeky and technical thing right now. But right. the more it goes on and the simpler it gets, that technology, it should end, should <laughs> end <laughs> any kind of Bitcoin theft ever. There's no reason for anyone to have their Bitcoin stolen ever again once this technology, multi-signature, becomes 
uh, that much easier to use. And this is the Manuel's definitely one of the guys who, who helped get that along and is moving that ball forward. I started, t- I, no, I, I get excited about talking <laughs> about all of these people just because no. they're just so interesting. And it's just, you know, it's such, it's a small community, but it's, you know, just from the people that I've just spoken about, you can tell that there's such an intensity about what they're doing and they're all doing it just to solve real problems and basic problems that they have, which is really exciting to see. Right. Yeah. We, we love these things too. And I mean, we talk about multi-signature all the time and how we really can't wait for it to be a lot more usable and beneficial for people. And we can't wait to see development there. And, uh, I really like how you're talking about the currency issues too in, in all these other places because we love Bitcoin in America and it's helpful in a lot of ways. It's quick and easy in a lot of ways, but we always say how there's other countries that have even more need for a currency like Bitcoin and because their currencies are falling apart. So yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And it's amazing when you actually see it up close. Like we took one of the, uh, an undercover camera, actually like one of the things that you see with uh, cops sometimes, how they clip cameras onto their vests. Uh, mm-hmm. And we actually went down into the um, uh, the underground black market where you can you literally buy and sell U.S. dollars for Argentine pesos. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing when you see that up close. Like it's just such, you know, it's just such a normal thing. Like, of, of course, I'm going to go into this, you know, little room underneath this uh, <laughs> shopping mall with my U.S. dollars, and they're going to give me, instead of $8 if I go to the bank, they're going to give me $12 because that's right. how, just how things work. And it's, as an American, it's definitely something, I mean, it's eye-opening, right? It's like you hear about these things and people talk about them, and then when you actually see them up close, it's definitely eye-opening. And it puts, I think, a lot of things into perspective, especially as we, you know, start to look at the financial future in our own country where, okay, what happens when quantitative easing stops and, you know, all of this free money starts coming to a point where uh, we might have to deal with inflation and, you know, what's going to happen then? So it takes a lot of sort of theoretical ideas and, and really starts to, you know, put them right in front of you so they're not so, not so theoretical anymore. I was just wondering, like, when did you first hear about Bitcoin? Like, do you remember your first time hearing about it? And when you did, was it like, did you get what it was right away? Or was it kind of like, oh, this sounds like a scam or something like that? No, I I think the first time I really heard about it was probably at the beginning, towards the beginning of last year of April of 2013. And the first time I heard about it, I thought it was just a different version of like, you know, World of Warcraft gold or something that was... <laughs> That was really gaming specific because I don't know if I heard about it in the context of Mt. Gox, but in my head, that's where I was thinking about it in terms of like magic, the online gathering Mt. Gox. (laughs) So I just associated it with, you know, a digital game currency, which since I didn't play those kinds of games, it didn't really pay too much attention. And then I think like a lot of people, once the April run up and crash of 2013, That's when, and it's funny because I think a lot of people are going to say this in the future about what's happening now. After that April of 2013 crash, I looked back and I was like, wait a minute, this thing's still around? (laughs) It's like, wait a minute, I thought this thing was supposed to be dead like, you know, a few, you know, five or six times before this. (laughs) And I think a lot of people are going to, you know, sometime in, you know, late 2014, who knows, maybe 2015, are going to be like, wait a minute, Bitcoin's still around? (laughs) <laughs> and then they're going to look at it again and be like, oh my goodness, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's been happening. And that's where I, I had left it after kind of the Cypress crash. Uh, and then a few months later, I went back to it and was like, okay, if this is still here, there must be something to it that I'm just not getting. So that's when I decided to dive in a little bit deeper and see if I could understand it a little bit more. Yeah, I think we get a lot of people who say that they weren't sure at first and it just took a little bit of time and they started to see things and they started to understand things. I know that's definitely true for me. I threw away, at the time, it was a couple cents worth of Bitcoin. I, I gave it to Tim. Yeah, that's not then, throwing away, Daniel. That's just sharing. <laughs> yeah, and then... I think I gave it back to you anyway, so... 
Maybe. Uh, no, you didn't. I'm sure you <laughs> I'm didn't. I'm pretty sure I did. But <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure you didn't. It's and it's worth five hundred dollars now, so I'll I'll take that whenever you. Okay. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So we get a lot of people with stories like that. So that's why we like to ask. You're listening to the You, Me, and BTC podcast. We need your help. First of all, we'd love it if you could check out our website, youmeandbtc.com. There you can find donation addresses for every single article and episode. And we'd love it if you could make use of those. We could also use some fans and followers, so if you're willing, please visit facebook or twitter.com slash youmeandbtc. Lastly, remember to subscribe to the show. You can do that on iTunes or sign up on our website to receive email updates. Thanks for your support. I noticed with your video, you have a tilt campaign. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, one of the uh, one of the things that we started to do once I decided, okay, I'm going to you know, make the effort and, and do this, you know, it's always the question of, okay, where does the money come from, right? Because, you know, it's one thing to write an article, you know, you can pretty much sit down and do that by yourself. You know, you take it to the next level and then you do a podcast and I'm sure you guys, you know, you have gear, you have a bit of equipment to bring up the production value. And then once you start to get into videos, then it's like, okay, now you have a crew, you've got other people and, you know, all of these things cost money, right? They don't come out of thin air. So I was like a lot of people thinking, okay, how am I going to finance this creative endeavor? And I definitely looked around to what other people were doing to see what was successful and see what was working and what wasn't working. And, you know, I went through all the options. It's like, okay, do I do a Kickstarter from the beginning? Do I create some sort of digital token? Do I wait until I find a, you know, an angel investor who's going to finance the whole thing? Or, uh, and ultimately I think I didn't want to, I guess I didn't want to have my creativity be on condition of someone else, right? So I didn't want to have to wait for somebody's permission to do this. And in that sense, I mean, I think that's kind of ins- one of the things that inspires me about Bitcoin. It's like, you don't have to get anyone's permission to do anything, really. So you, you just go out and do it. If you want to trade with someone, you trade with someone. If you want to move your money here, you move your money there. You don't have to have a third party to give you permission to do anything. So I just decided, you know what? I'm just going to go do it. Uh-huh. And I basically, I financed the whole thing by myself, you know, getting down there and, and the crew that we had down there and all the, the editing and the, the music licensing and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I was, I was talking to, and this is specifically how the, the tilt campaign came about. Uh, as I said, I live in Los Angeles and I've had the, uh, the good fortune to, um, meet Brock Pierce, who's on the board of the Bitcoin Foundation, but he's also, he's a, a noted investor. He's got uh, this place in Santa Monica, California, which is on the west side of Los Angeles. It's called Bitropolis. And it's another one of those, you know, buildings that has a bunch of different creative companies in the Bitcoin space. Uh, GoCoin's there, ExpressCoin is there. And they've got a couple, a few other companies that are all under the same roof and, you know, kind of creating a, a community that's making stuff right? They're making stuff and putting (laughs) things out and making things work. And uh met with him a few times and he he's given me a bunch of advice. And I was like, you know, I was planning on going to Cryptolina to show the film. And he's like, you know, you guys should do a crowdfunding campaign. I was like, well, we already made the movie. Why would you do a crowdfunding campaign (laughs) for a film that you've you've already made? And he basically got me thinking about, and I'm going to you know jump off to a, a different tangent, Vitalik Buterin, who a lot of people know him as one of the creators of Ethereum, but he also founded Bitcoin Magazine. And he was one of the first people, you know, way back when, 2011, 2012, maybe, who was one of the first people to write articles about what was happening in the Bitcoin universe. And what he would do is write an article and he'd put out the beginning of the article, uh, a paragraph or so, and kind of put that out into the community. And then he'd wait until people sent him Bitcoin. And <laughs> once he got to a, a certain point, then he'd uh, end the embargo and, and release the film. And that's sort of what 
made it possible for ultimately what became Bitcoin Magazine to be born. So he basically got me thinking, how can we kind of change the model of production, right? So it's, it's rather than waiting on people to give you money to do something, why not just go out and say, I did this. <laughs> and if you like this, and if you want more of this, then help right. me continue what we've already done. Exactly. So in that sense, we're calling it proof of production, right? It's like, once you see this film, and if you really look at it and go, man, there should be more of stuff like that, then it's your responsibility to create stuff like that, right? I mean, that's what this whole, you know, this whole universe is about in the Bitcoin universe. It's like, there's no one else who's coming to make this, right? There's no one <laughs> who's going to do this for you. Whatever this is going to be, it's going to be because people make it, right? So this is one of those things. It's, we all, I think, know on some level that the media as it stands probably isn't going to do much in terms of helping to spread the more positive elements of this technology. It's easy to do Mount Gox. It's easy to focus on Silk Road because as someone who lives and works in Los Angeles will tell you, those things sell. They're fast and cheap and easy to make, right? And people will eat it up all day. So until there's an alternative to that, then we're still going to, we're just going to keep getting the same stories. Bitcoin's about buying drugs. Bitcoin's about <laughs> this. Bitcoin's about that. And until someone actually makes the effort to go, oh, wait a minute. Actually, it's about this, this, and this. Right, right. And this is the beginning of, of that process. So kind of circling all the, all the way back, it's, so we got inspired to do the crowdfunding, not necessarily to kind of pay back, but more to look forward to being able to release this, open it up to the community. Hopefully the community will say there's value in that. We should have more of that kind of stuff. So there you go. Sweet. Yeah, that's that's great. We Yeah, we talk about a lot, I guess, how right now Bitcoin is kind of centered around the technical community and it kind of turns people off. So I think it's awesome to see people like you like doing a movie. And, like you were saying, it kind of, there's a point where things need to be dumbed down a little bit. And I think that's great. And I, I love the focus on people showing how it's actually helped them in real ways. Another thing that we talk about, or at least I do, because <laughs> it, I guess it's kind of one of my pet topics is the crowdfunding thing. I, I'm a big supporter of crowdfunding and I think Daniel and Tim are too. Could you maybe just for anyone listening in if in case they want to check out your campaign do you want to maybe talk about the the rewards a little bit uh sure yeah if you go to our website which is the protocol.tv the biggest first link that you see that hits you right in the face is a link to the uh the crowdfunding page and basically it's the rewards are different levels of credits in the film my hope is that this has a little bit of uh a little bit of longevity to it so it's you know the ability to one, to have your name in the credits on different levels, whether that's as the executive producer, which is generally the first title that you see, or in the scrolling credits at the end. But basically what you're buying are different levels of badges of support, if you will. And you know, one of the things, um, and very quickly just to go back, there are a couple of different reward levels where you actually get a, a download of a high quality digital download or uh, a DVD thanks on Twitter and, and various uh, credits in the film. So those are all the, the different rewards. And, you know, this is um, the first crowdfunding campaign that, that I've done for, that I've done, period. So specifically for myself, obviously. But I'm finding out just there's a lot of interesting dynamics. And I'm curious to see, uh, especially if we are able to continue and do more of these, to see what dynamics are particular to this project and if we're able to see some longer term trends, you know, some of the things that I've learned along the way, and, and this is our crowdfunding campaign has basically just gone through its first week. As of yesterday, there's another two weeks or so to go. And people on one level, a lot of people are giving without really expecting anything in return. So for example, a lot of the uh, rewards that 
people would get at, let's say, $5, which is a, a Twitter shout out. Uh, we've got a lot of contributions using change tip and people are sending a dollar or two dollars or three dollars <laughs> or something like that, which is below the reward level, but they're clearly, you know, wanting to show, uh, at the very least their enthusiasm and support. So without necessarily wanting anything in return. So that's encouraging to see. And then there's a bunch of people who've who've specified a reward and let's say the reward that they want is at $50 and they'll give like $10 more or $20 more than that. Not necessarily enough to go to the next level of reward, but just clearly showing that, that they want to give whatever it is that they want to give. So it's rewarding on, on one level just to see that, you know, for the most part, the people that are enthusiastic, they're enthusiastic about it, right? So whether it's, a credit in the film or whether it's a, a t-shirt, I don't think it really matters to them. I think, you know, they just want to support something that they, that they believe in. And from someone on the other end, it's great for, for us because it's like, you know, I don't think anyone really wants to spend one, their time and two, their money basically making things that you basically just have to send right back out. I mean, why not just take that money and actually put it into the thing that you want to produce. That's one of the things that's always sort of bothered me about the the Kickstarter model. I mean, ultimately, you know, I mean, if we can get honest about it, what we'd like to do is get to a point where we can use something like this. And then, you know, I think what Swarm is trying to do and actually build true equity crowdfunding where, I mean, if you create something and that thing makes money, then I think you should have the ability to share the rewards with whoever it is that helped you make that thing, right? Obviously, I think a lot of people look at the the Oculus VR as just the the prime example of that idea. We're not there on a on a legal standpoint, but I think from a technical standpoint, we're getting much closer to it. So, you know, these are things that they weren't possible until, you know, you had the capacity for something like Bitcoin to, you know, allow people to send you know, small amounts of money like a dollar or two dollars or three dollars and fifty cents or something like that. And it starts to add up and it really starts to make a difference. I just want to say, I think the change tip thing on Twitter is pretty cool. And I tried it out a couple of days ago and I sent Tim a pat on the back, which I think is worth like 50 cents or something. So that that's pretty cool. We'll probably have to talk about that in one of our future episodes. Yeah, that's uh it's funny that you mentioned that because, uh, if you also, if you go to, uh, our site on, uh, the protocol.tv, I have a blog post at the bottom of that. It was basically like a, a one week update on our crowdfunding campaign. And I just kind of listed some of the things that I had gone through. And one of the flip sides of this is just the accounting issue, <laughs> the <laughs> problems of, of accounting. And it's just trying to keep track of, of everything. Uh, we use change tip. We had contributions come in directly through an anonymous address that we put on our tilt page. We have a Coinbase link. We have uh, BitPay uh, links for each of the reward items. So all of those different companies all use a sort of different reporting format. So trying to reconcile everything and keep track of everything is a little bit mind-boggling, but it's definitely a, a growing pain that hopefully over time it'll it'll get worked out. I mean, how much is a pat on the back? Exactly. You have to go look it up somewhere. And, yeah. I think I got popcorn and snacks. <laughs> and I guess you could give somebody three pats on the back or 50 of them, maybe. <laughs> well, hey, one of the last things I want to do, uh, we do this with all of our guests. And actually, we've already gotten a number of somewhat personal Bitcoin stories from you. And I've really loved this conversation. I don't know. There's just lots of good stuff. I love the way you see Bitcoin and the way you... I don't know, just all the observations you've made about how you really just have to start sharing Bitcoin and how, hey, I'm, I'm a, I make videos and I tell stories. Why don't I put that into Bitcoin? I like those kinds of things. So that's been really cool. But yeah, like I was saying, one of the things we like to do with all of our guests is just ask you for a personal story that's related to Bitcoin. Uh, we get several scam stories, which are pretty fun. But you know, anything more serious maybe too, if you've seen how Bitcoin can change the world in a really personal, specific way, which again, we've already gotten a little bit like that out of you, but I'll still just ask the question in case you have anything else that you want to share 
some sort of personal story related to Bitcoin? Good question. Wow. Uh, let's see. The first thing that's come into my mind for whatever reason. <laughs> uh, so I actually, for a month and a half uh, last year, I was a Bitcoin miner. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, uh, you know, w as I said, once I kind of pointed myself in, in this direction, and this was at, let's say, the end of I guess about November of, uh, of 2013 of last year, I was like, I really want to understand. I don't have to master everything, but I'll feel a lot more comfortable if I know how things work. I mean, that's kind of generally how I, how I am. It's like, I, I don't need to be a programmer as long as I understand what it is that this program is doing and how it's going about it. So I looked into Bitcoin mining and I was like, well, let's just see if I can find a Bitcoin miner. And this is, it's the end of last year, right? So it's just like the price is going like crazy uh, <laughs> and people are, you know, really getting kind of frothy around the mouth. And I was like, well, it doesn't sound like doing pre-orders is a good idea. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'm not going to do a pre-order. And I went on to Craigslist in Los Angeles and I ended up finding two uh, Butterfly Labs uh, 60 giga hash miners, which at the time were like, wow, that's 60 giga hash. And the two of the guys, two different people, both had the same story where they bought the miners, let's say in like March or April or something like that. And of course it's Butterfly Lab, so it didn't <laughs> get delivered for another like eight months or something like that. And they both got them and the price had just shot up like crazy, right? So this is, like I said, November. So it's probably, you know, well into the three digits approaching four digits. Um, and both of them had the same story, which is they got the miners, they unboxed them. They were so disgusted. <laughs> they plugged them in to make sure that they worked. And then they turned around and put them on Craigslist. And I bought them the next day. <laughs> <laughs> so That's awesome. I ended up mining Bitcoin for about six weeks. And then there, it's actually kind of a little bit of a hassle. I mean, the machines themselves were great, but you know, you have to pay attention to them and, and kind of babysit them a little bit. And I was going to be, uh, going to Minnesota for, uh, where my fiance's family lives. And, uh, I was going to be away for a couple of weeks. So I was like, eh, I don't want to deal with them. And I sold them right before PayPal did the, the kibosh on selling, uh, any kind of Bitcoin gear through eBay. So. That was my, uh, my tales from the Bitcoin mines. <laughs> but one of the, it's a, a kind of a random story, but one of the things I think it really does is once you can kind of take the esoteric and ethereal, it's like, ah, Bitcoin mining, it's so mysterious. And, you know, once you have a machine, you plug it in, you put in some things and it's like, oh, this is what Bitcoin mining is. <laughs> and I think it's that level of comfortability. Once people get to a point where, you know, they're not so worried about this thing that they don't understand in the same way that, I mean, I don't know what happens when I flick the light switch on in, in this room, but it's a light switch. I flick it on and it works. <laughs> so I think once we can get to that point with Bitcoin, I think that's when we're going to start to see that next level of growth and adoption and kind of getting things to be that comfortable. Hopefully some of the things that I'm working on sort of helps that along the way. Yeah, that's, we always have fun with butterfly labs too. And we've had a, a story, uh, I think one or two other stories that were like that with miners and such. And, uh, and also I, I definitely agree that we can't wait to till people are just using Bitcoin and they, they're not too concerned about how it works and everything like that. Kind of like a credit card or even bank transfers. Nobody really knows or cares what exactly the information is doing and who it's going to or where it's going. They just say, send this money here and right now it takes days and days and days sometimes, or right now it's really risky with credit cards and such, but hopefully with Bitcoin, people can find things just as easy, but a lot more convenient and everything. So sweet. Yeah. Yeah. I like what you said there about how you don't have to really completely understand it, but you want to have kind of like a grasp and you think that'll help. That's basically how I feel like, as Daniel knows how bad I am with <laughs> trying to figure out anything like really complicated on a computer, but... Like, once you start to understand a little bit better, it doesn't, I mean, exactly like what you said, it's not as mysterious and strange. Whereas if I try to explain Bitcoin stuff to people, they kind of just look at me because I don't know enough about it to really explain it very well to them. Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, that's such an important thing. And 
And I think that's one of the things that we're going to focus on with the protocol.tv and, and some of the things that we're starting to do. You know, I think there's a, there's a, an impulse to want to explain Bitcoin. And it's like, I don't think you really need to do that. Right. Cause you can't do it. Right. It's like, if you just started talking about, I mean, people's eyes are going to glaze over before they get <laughs> the big picture. So, you know what? If you can't do it, then don't do it. How about just starting? with one thing and explaining that one thing or just showing that one thing or just, you know, doing something that makes sense to the person that you're talking to and just explain that one thing. If it's a merchant, you know, just talk to them, you know, don't talk to them about everything. That's it. Just talk to them. You know what? You pay X percent to your credit card processor. You can pay less by using this right? and put it into a language where they can get it. It's like, okay, this is something in my life that I can relate it to. And that way, you kind of meet them in a place where they already are rather than trying to, you know, drag them along, along with you. So, you know, it's something that I think, you know, everyone who's involved in, in some way is kind of, uh, an ambassador. So that <laughs> as many people as there are, there are going to be that many different ways to try to help it explain, uh, what's happening. And, uh, if I could sort of bleed that into, uh, one of the next things that I'm, I'm really excited about as I was in Cryptolina, one of the people that I, I got to speak to was involved with uh, Sam Patterson, who's involved with uh, Open Bazaar. And uh, they have their first release that's going to be coming up, uh, I believe it's next week. And I'm not sure how familiar you are with the, the story of, of Open Bazaar and, and how it came about. But that's one of those things where it's like you can put it in terms of, okay, it's eBay, but without the crazy fees, right? <laughs> right? So people can can just okay, you already know what it is even if you don't know, you know, the inner workings of it and it's open source and it's peer to peer and blah 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 blah. It's eBay's but without the crazy fee. Okay, we got <laughs> it. So that's something where you can like, you know, put it into just basic simple terms where people start to get. So I think moving along those lines at least then and what I'm trying to do is important to me and it's exactly where where I think the bigger picture, where we all sort of need to to start going. Uh, one last thing, just to wrap it up, Valerian, what would be the best way if people wanted to get in contact with you? I know you've already given us the, the website, but you can probably give that to us again. But for people to either get in contact with you or see what you're doing and just to get in into the crowdfunding campaign. Sure. As I said, you can go to our website, uh, theprotocol.tv. That's got the crowdfunding link, uh, first thing that you see. Um, you can also join us on Twitter. Love Twitter. It's, I think, uh, it's one of the awesomest ways to just get in touch directly with people. Our Twitter handle is the protocol TV, all one word. You can also, uh, join our, once you go to, uh, our webpage, you'll also see a, uh, a newsletter. We're going to start to send out a daily video digest. We're calling it the hash, which is a daily Bitcoin intelligence brief. So basically it has the, the news wrapped up in uh, a very short, easily digestible kind of morsel. Uh, and then the other thing that we're, we're looking forward to do is start to put out um, a lot of the interviews that we're doing along the way. As I said, we spoke with uh, Sam Patterson from uh, Open Bazaar. Uh, we've got one of the guys from Swarm at Cryptolina. We had a chance to sit down with uh, Ed Moy, who is the former director of the U.S. Mint. Uh, we had a nice, good, long conversation with him. Amazing, amazing guy. I can't wait to put that one out. And also, uh, Adam Draper from, uh, Boost VC. And, um, he's just, he's one of those investors that, you know, you look around a lot of the successful companies and you see where a lot of them were incubated or, or mentored. And, and he's at a lot of, I mean, he's just at the center of a lot of them. So uh, it's great to pick his mind and uh, look forward to getting that one out. Uh, as I said, the next one is going to be, to go along with the release of, of Open Bazaar. So keep your eyes out for that one. And, uh, the best way, as I said, to, to get in touch with us is, you know, follow us on Twitter or go to the protocol.tv and get on the hash daily brief and we'll keep you updated. And of course, if you just want to get in touch with me, if you can remember my first name, it's V A L E R I A N. Not too many dudes in Bitcoin named Valerian. <laughs> uh, so it's Valerian at the protocol.tv. All right. Awesome. Well, hey, one more thing. Is it okay if we grab some or maybe even all of the audio from the Buenos Aires clip and put it in the podcast? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Awesome. Hey, yeah, maybe we'll put it right here. Maybe it'll be at the beginning. I guess our listeners will see. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, Valerian Bennett from the protocol.tv. Thanks a whole lot for joining us. I really love this. Yeah, thanks a lot. Awesome, guys. Thanks for having me. So when we ask ourselves, why does Bitcoin matter in North America? The answer is, it doesn't. You go to Argentina, the currency is devaluing at 30% a year. And for these people, Bitcoin is now a choice. Bitcoin offers for the first time on a global basis the opportunity for people to make a choice. To make a choice to uh, use a currency that is outside of the control of hierarchical institutions that have become corrupted everywhere. And that's why I think Bitcoin is much more than just a currency. Latin America's third largest economy is headed down the path toward default for the second time in 13 years. If Argentina defaults again, the economy will continue to shrink. Most of all, Argentinians are worried about their savings. If you're walking by the downtown, you will see a lot of people saying cambio, cambio, offering you to exchange your dollars for pesos. If there's any type of people that we're going to convince to start using an alternative currency, it's going to be Argentines. Thanks for listening to episode 35. We'll see you next Thursday online or Monday on Chain Radio.